introduction of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite introduction paris has often been described by travellers by artists by savants by friends and by enemies yet it was after reading most of the works descriptive of paris that i felt how much there was still to be written if not about paris at least about the parisians english prejudices of two centuries ago still swayed the minds and guided the pen of english writers they came to paris imbued with these prejudices and having no means of penetrating into the inner life of the parisians they judged of the surface swayed unconsciously perhaps by traditional errors and by a hatred which under the influence of a more complete acquaintanceship and a common interest excited by civilization against barbarianism is rapidly disappearing the englishman now no longer looks on his nearest neighbour as his mortal foe still though the monuments of paris its sites its cafes and its streets may have been well and accurately described the soul of this moving population has remained to the transient visitor enveloped in a brilliant but impenetrable veil though born in england and somewhat of a cosmopolitan paris has been my home and its language was the first i ever spoke i have never judged it as a stranger and was not for many years aware of the utterly absurd and false notions entertained by other nations with regard to the private life of the people supposed to be best known and certainly the most frequently visited of all european cities i believe that foreigners know more about the domestic manners of the inhabitants of the sandwich islands than they do about the domestic manners of the parisians indeed the general opinion i am convinced is that the parisians have no domestic manners at all to describe and that the piles and piles of houses are merely built to afford a temporary shelter for the night but that the actual existence of the parisians goes on in the streets the cafes and the theatres it is to correct these errors to show the parisians as they are scrupulous in the virtues which bind society together loyal and true in all the relations of the domestic affections and devoted to family ties that i have undertaken the following chapters not as a guide-book to the monuments of paris but a guide-book to its hearts and hearths the french are though cordial and polite in manner reserved and unostentatious besides being generally very little versed in foreign languages so that neither through their intercourse with foreigners nor their knowledge of foreign literature could they be aware of how wrongly they were judged or probably the work i now offer to the public would have been written long since and by an abler pen such as it is however with all its faults i claim for it two merits one that it is true and another that the subjects treated are entirely new in the view taken of them and in the revelations they contain the homes of paris are perhaps for the first time described and though it has been said that the word home has no equivalent in the french language the thing itself is essentially french just as the word ennui cannot be translated into anglo-saxon though the thing itself is most unquestionably indigenous to the english soil some of the chapters of this work appeared in a new york journal of a high character from thence they were copied into several european periodicals encouraged by this approval i was induced to complete the work anxious as i was that the truth should be known and that the people of the united states the companions of lafayette and lestin should in memory of their chivalric companionship with the fathers of the american revolution whilst according their admiration not withhold from the french either their friendship or their esteem in all the humbler and holier duties of domestic life end of the introduction chapter one of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the first entrance into paris who has not been to paris what is there can be said of paris that has not been said already well after the fall of napoleon there was a great gathering of nations and now railways and steamships have opened the roads and the high seas to all continental and insular travellers 
and yet how few who are not parisians born have really literally seen more of paris than its surface if we could open the diary of most travellers we should have but to change the date and their parisian experiences might do for vienna berlin london brussels or naples there have been english and americans who have resided in paris and never set foot in a real parisian house and home for there is such a thing as a parisian home though we know that the general opinion is that the parisians live in the street feed at the restaurateurs and receive their friends either on the boulevards or in the cafes well true to speak as our carriage brings us from the debarcadere or railroad depot along the boulevards and turns down the rue richelieu it does seem as if all paris has come out to greet us in london it is said that the countryman stood still till people had gone by but in paris one could not be tempted to stand still such is the joyous holiday look of all that one feels disposed to inquire what there is to be seen and where everybody is going in order to rush on and join in the fun there is truly no particular occasion of rejoicing but they are happy that their day's toil is done and they come home casting away all care and fear for the morrow to enjoy what the rich and wealthy give them the view of all the luxuries in the shop windows the sight of the prancing horses the gay equipages the lighted streets the pretty faces under pretty bonnets and the eccentricities of les drôles d'anglais now we have dashed into the hotel des princes the broad courtyard is quite imposing the picturesque effect of the medley somewhat marred by the absence of the rope harnessed horses and the seven-leagued booted postillon over whom the railroad has long since whirled but we see the lights gleaming from every window in the building as they do in the castle of lammermoor while the tenor is dying in the opera of that name that there is an ample welcome waiting for us then come forth through the glass doors of the hall an officious phalanx of servants the same phrase is sounded in your ear in many languages till you are found out to be anglais to a frenchman the grand political event of the declaration of independence does not exist and those who speak english are all to him subjects of the queen of great britain consigned to the care of your countryman he hands you out of your carriage he ushers you in and knowing the rooms disengaged walks you up the grand staircase and enconces you in your apartment now at the hotel des princes you may go and dine at the table d'hote if you please for there is a table d'hote and one at which nobody dines although it is always full beware o oh, most unwary traveller of all you will meet there beware especially of the princes with offs and skies at the end of their names they are mostly but wandering cossuths in search of voluntary contributions for the relief of themselves beware too of messieurs les comtes and messieurs les marquis parisians of high rank though if ever you get really among men of rank you will look in vain for these noblemen they however welcome you most warmly and they really do feel some of the pleasure they express at seeing you for they intend to get something out of you that charming old lady too ah she must be the type of the old ladies for which parisian society is so celebrated that most unpretending dress the soft grey hair shading eyes still so bright and expressive that small white hand the gentle unobtrusive manner beware for this lady has a friend this friend a woman of high birth one of the belles of the last century was so fortunate though she immigrated to have by some miraculous process her immense fortune preserved for her this has enabled her to keep up a fine establishment and to receive a great deal of company especially foreigners englishmen in particular for the english were so good to her in exile now your friend of the grey hair will introduce you it is a great favour but then you are so attractive so charmant she is an old woman and may therefore say so you are a young dandy and will believe her of course and pull up your shirt-collar at the compliment so you one evening are introduced into the brilliant drawing-room of this interesting exile by your friend be as grateful as you please enjoy yourself as much as you can only don't think that you have got into parisian society and above all don't play bouillotte or lansquenette then too at this table d'hote of the hotel des princes is an english family 
its daughters so straight and fair with their flowing ringlets their pearly teeth their stiff petticoats and bare shoulders then the mamma all blue satin gown and crimson cashmere scarf with rings on every finger and black mittens instead of gloves that she may show them papa in black from head to foot sleek and solemn wanting but a star to look quite ministerial then the son and heir with blonde moustache a waist as slim as his sister's dressed in a way to enchant both a tailor and a hairdresser supercilious and sulky sulky that he isn't a lord supercilious that he may pass for one and so afraid of anything revealing that he is not court-bred that he frowns at his sisters until they get bewildered in their ideas of right and wrong and don't know whether they ought to take the asparagus in their fingers or drink champagne while it foams these good people are from the wrong side of temple bar don't breathe that you are an american or they'll snub you don't try to conciliate or they'll patronize you and monopolize you in which case you might as well have promenaded up and down broadway with some of its bells as to have come to paris to enjoy paris and the parisians no parisian of distinction ever dines at a table d'hote to english people of any position it is especially repulsive at the hotel however they will give you all your meals in your own room without the steps of the waiter who brings it being converted into francs and figuring on your bill the hotels of the place vendome good only for long purses are english to the core hotel de bristol hotel de londres hotel st james in the rue st honore is english here once resided the fair lavalliere here still is to be seen the chamber under her own apartment communicating by a spiral staircase with her room up which the impetuous and amorous louis the fourteenth used to bound in his youth the historical hotel st james is now english even to its prices hotel bedford in the same street is english or rather in its habits of go-ahead noise and bustle resembles more nearly an american caravansary the aristocratic hotels beneath the arches of the rue de rivoli with their proud names hotel de l'europe de flandre de milan etc are all english so is the father of all hotels the venerable meurice any one on gambling thoughts intent might safely make a bet of any amount that not one of these hotels contains a french family very few french bachelors even live in hotels and none certainly in these headquarters of the english the french have a hatred of living in common with strangers they are fond of society of theatres of outdoor amusements but contradictory to the received ideas the french have a strong love of home however poor however humble every french family has a home of its own where it can keep the prying eye of idle curiosity from either its smiles or its tears there are however real french hotels to which an american or an englishman never strayed some of these hotels have table d'hote but there are few ladies and the men are men of business here to-day and gone to-morrow in these hotels when you enter out from a loge a construction the size of a bandbox manufactured behind the big gate pops a portiere tidy and trim with a smile on her face and a bunch of keys in her hand she nods to the man who brings your baggage she knows all the ticket porters in paris the latter courteously salutes madame antoine and quietly seats himself on his truck waiting till your whereabouts has been assigned you she cannot keep monsieur standing so with many bows curtsies and more words than you thought necessary to settle the whole negotiation you find yourself introduced into the loge there is a well-stuffed and well-polished armchair you look around you on the chimney a small gilded edition of the princess marie's jeanne d'arc surmounts a fine loud ticking clock on each side of it are china vases with artificial flowers and glass shades in the ample fireplace well packed with the accumulated ashes of a whole season blazes a bright wood fire at the extremity of the room is the mahogany bedstead gracefully becurtained which curtains forming at once a screen and a drapery conceal the culinary apparatus of madame antoine in which she cooks not only her own potage and petits plats but also contrives to give breakfast to some dozen or two lodgers in the hotel madame antoine seeing you comfortable then proceeds to state 
that she has such and such a room with an alcove charming for any one who receives ah monsieur does not receive company eh bien then she will give you a simple chambre à coucher number forty number fifty does monsieur object to the seventh story monsieur certainly does oh oh she sees monsieur does not mind paying you english are so rich now you are irrevocably an englishman from the mere fact of your being white for a portiere in paris thinks all americans black after enumerating all the rooms she has to let which won't suit you she finally takes you to the one you want there throwing the door wide open voici with a triumphant tone a fine room two nice windows with red and white curtains a fine mirror between the windows large red velvet sofa armchairs a round marble table in the middle of the room a snug bed with befrilled pillows and draperies to match the windows a fine clock ticking as loudly and of a much larger size than the one below flowers and vases to match lots of ashes in the fireplace logs ready to blaze at a moment's warning a tiny piece of carpet before it and another before your bed an oak floor as polished as your table a small invisible closet about three feet square containing all your washing apparatus in another corner a large wardrobe and bureau are ready to receive your clothes will this do of course it will do how much here you mentally calculate what a small den in new york minus every comfort and luxury but the one indispensable chair and table would cost forty francs says madame antoine a week eh non a month then there is ten francs a month for the service that is the keeping your room in order brushing your clothes cleaning your boots etc then for six francs she madame antoine will furnish you with breakfast and monsieur will dine where he pleases will that do of course it will do then a smile a bow and summoned by the clear shrill tones of madame antoine your porter brings your baggage into your room another call from madame antoine out of a staircase window brings a certain jean wearing noiseless list slippers he has a feather brush under his arm and brings a shovel with live coals into your room these bestowed on the expectant logs and helped by a little blowing from a most ornate pair of bellows which form part of your furniture set off in a cheerful blaze then madame antoine looks around tells you not to mind ringing or if jean don't come quickly at that you can follow her example and scream for him out of the window and so hoping you will be pleased with all everybody and everything as seems to have been the case with herself all through life she ends at last by shutting the door and vanishing so here you are for fifty-six francs or eleven dollars per month secure of a good apartment attendance and your breakfast your firing will cost about fifteen francs a month three dollars more besides all this you have the motherly care of madame antoine who unless she be an exception to the class will positively take an interest in you thinking that for the time being your interests are hers now these hotels are to be found in the rue de maille about the rue montmartre the place de la bourse and so on or in the faubourg st germain but there they have another character and deteriorate considerably from those on this side of the seine if you go to paris to see your own countrymen and vie with them in expense keep to your quartier des tuileries but if you are so fortunate as to get into real intellectual vivacious genuine french society it will take nothing from your marriage that you live in a quartier known to be cheaper than another your reception will be just as cordial and your credit with your french correspondent greater than if you lived amongst the nouveau riche in paris you must depend on yourself for your own success there it is not what has he but what is he that decides the question End of chapter 1
paris in may is sufficient to convert the veriest hypochondriac into a cheerful hopeful good-natured being this climate has no doubt a great influence on the character of the people and accounts for their joyousness their excitability their wit l'esprit court les rues is true in paris more than in any other country in the world wit is to be found in every station from unpretending clever repartee to the real metaphysical sparkle of such jousters with words as alfred de musset Janet, merimee car dumas balzac etc but then in paris every one has the first element without which everything will be false meretricious and cold l'esprit de sa position the dignity of one's own position a thorough self-reliance and a respect for the position of others in france the lower and middle classes after all the heart of a nation for the richer if not higher class have a monstrous family resemblance with each other all over the world are not discouraged by feeling that for them there is nothing but toil toil or that a relaxation from labour is their only recreation these classes have pleasures of their own so that they are not mortified when they can afford them by being brought in contact with the supercilious and refined parvenu in all countries merciless and ruthless who can sneer at their awkwardness or laugh at the discrepancies of their costume the working classes however rich would never assume any other dress than their hereditary costume and neighbors and friends shake their heads and honest young mechanics turn away from a girl who wears mantillas and dons a silk bonnet elle porte chapeau means almost a dereliction from virtue a tradesman's wife would never wear diamonds excepting the smallest of brooches and earrings and these only on such occasions as a wedding ball or a civic feast and that desideratum of all french women an india shawl would never be seen on the shoulders of an employé or of any person whose revenue was known not to warrant such an expense there is however a lady of the chaussee d'antin who envelops her fairy feet in a superb delhi shawl embroidered in gold when she goes out in her carriage but then she is the wife of a stockbroker and her revenue is of course fabulous like all of that class in more senses than one another effect of the parisian climate so exhilarating scarcely ever over warm or over cold is that it has made the flaneur a word which can be explained but not translated it means an easy sauntering without any definite object though enjoying all it means a good-humoured search after comfort and amusement without previous design or preparation skimming from life as it passes by the cream and never going deep enough to get at the dregs or to trouble and darken the stream foreigners have much difficulty in understanding this habit and many call it idleness especially those for whom bustle means activity and who think nothing achieved if not done with noise and toil now the boulevards were created arranged and are kept up for the flaneur let us then turn flaneur and saunter through them from one end to the other place de la madeleine here do not stand à l'anglaise with your murray or gallic nanny in hand backing on to the harmless pedestrians or under some pawing horse come here here in the midst of this flower market on this stone bench surrounded by roses geraniums and heliotropes watch well this structure which greece scarce equalled and of which roman ruins have left no model observe the simplicity of the design the magic effect is produced greatly from the admirable proportions see how the sun glances through that colonnade and illumines those beautifully finished statues in their niches by the first sculptors of france the façade has a beautiful frieze but you know all that and you know also all the marvels in painting and sculpture of the interior it is a lovely temple though some object to it as being too much a temple and that the absence of knaves takes away from its religious character there are people whose religion depends on gothic aisles and painted windows now before we begin our pilgrimage look around you there is no crowd in this flower market and if you look at the flowers and plants you will see that they are the rarest loveliest and most evanescent the camellias and roses all in fullest bloom everything in fact at the moment of perfection 
the purchasers seek pleasures as fragile as these flowers they live from day to day trusting to chance for the long years before them see through the leafy screens you catch glimpses of lovely women choosing their flowers they are amongst the most celebrated of paris they form a society of themselves they have at their disposal the largest fortunes in paris they live in the midst of those celebrities one of whom would suffice to send a provincial town mad with curiosity artists of the highest repute immortalize their beauties in their pictures and statues nature often as liberal in mental gifts has endowed them with wit as well as beauty and a strange wild education has frequently developed talents of no mean order you see with what exquisite simplicity and taste they are dressed how perfectly modest and retiring is the whole tenor of their manner and demeanour do you know what class you have before you the class that takes its graceful name from the boudoir of a church they frequent the revered sanctuary of notre dame de lorette at the end of the rue lafitte has for disciples les lorettes they are a mighty expensive luxury in paris and a dangerous one if you are on the young side of five-and-twenty for the lorette have often seriously captivated nay even deceived for in paris vice must assume a virtue if it have it not the good taste of the parisians is their eminent virtue i can forgive a crime it may have some grand motive but never an awkwardness it is so useless said madame recamier the woman who reigned as belle for twenty years and as a bel esprit under the sentimental patronage of chateaubriand for twenty more proceed we on our pilgrimage here as we merge fairly on to the boulevards we are enveloped in a confusion of omnibuses of which vehicles this is a culminating point for six sous you can get taken from here to the bastille and then without additional pay get a correspondence on to vincennes but still more wonderful you can take one of those little blue citadines with its good well-fed horse and respectable driver for twenty-five sous la course or forty for an hour the carriage holding two and both being carried for the same price citadines are much patronized for visiting etc french women have a hatred of public conveyances and then it is supreme bad taste to go in an omnibus in anything but the simplest dress so that the citadine is the resource of all who want to make a toilette turn round if you come near a citadine for the chances are that you will see a pretty face now we are at the boulevard des capucines and the crowd increases fed from the broad rue de la paix and its place vendome whose immortal column rises in the distance here too is the hotel of foreign affairs elegant cabriolet with a variety of coronets from which spring perfumed and elegant attaches stand before its gates men of business bankers stockbrokers the aristocrats of the parisian exchange planeurs artists officers on half pay on full pay and on no pay at all these latter being hungarians or exiled italians ladies hurrying to their milliners blanchisseuses with their snowy caps pretty feet and huge baskets young girls so quietly unobtrusive walking with downcast eyes by the side of their mothers animated and elegant editions of themselves looking scarce five years older all moving along towards the boulevard des italiens the boulevard of the whole par excellence what brilliant shops on this side where we are walking and with what harmony of colours with what elegance is all disposed within too what politeness and then there is such a preponderance of nice neat civil young shopwomen instead of your gawky shopman either pert or surly as he may happen to consider the state of life in which he is placed women keep all the books in the various shops of paris they sit enthroned in comfortable armchairs with their desk and ledger before them and when your purchase is completed you go with your bill your parcel and your money escorted by the clerk who has served you and pay these charming invariably polite and quick ciphering cashiers particularly agreeable and flattering too it is to go to boivins privats mayors or any gantier and have your hand taken and then your fingers gradually insinuated by hands soft and white 
terminating the task by buttoning the button you always fumble at and a voila monsieur a smile and a modest flash of a dark eye through the long lashes no wonder frenchmen wear light-coloured gloves it is a pleasure to buy every day a fresh pair how many parisians how many foreigners never progress beyond this oasis not in the desert but in the busiest and gayest of all cities the boulevard des italiens is the concentration of fashion gaiety brilliancy and business for business in paris assumes as far as possible the garb of pleasure in no case is it the sole aim of life but the means of obtaining all the enjoyments comforts and pleasures without which life is nothing to a frenchman money-making was never reckoned amongst the enjoyments of a parisian man of business nor has he any idea of sacrificing any portion of his existence exclusively to that grubbery he enjoys life as it passes rather putting off the consummation of his fortune than foregoing its advantages it is probably for some such reason that at about one o'clock the stockbrokers bankers speculators a tutti quanti jews and all emigrate from the bourse to the stone steps and the sidewalk in front of tortini's extending on to the passage de l'opera where a formidable areopagus decide on the state of the money market and the condition of the corps de ballet now the passage de l'opera has two entrances upon the boulevards and two communications with the opera house at the other end by a most singular coincidence the hour at which business commences at tortini's the chapel of ease to the bourse it terminates at the salle de danse of the opera the rehearsal of the ballet concludes the nymphs rehearsing in dirty satin shoes cotton tights and calico petticoats linen polkas and muslin caps substitutes for the gossamer robes with fleshings and spangles of the evening resume their morning costume and as after being goddesses for two hours at night when the curtain is down they become mere mortals so after finishing their rehearsal from dirty impudent perspiring hard-working dancing girls they become charming women of fashion enveloped in cashmere shawls their delicate features enshrouded in the lace and flowers of lors or lucioquet's bonnets with snowy perfumed handkerchief in hand all elegance and helplessness thus by this most singular chance these business men have the privilege of seeing the heroines of the footlights some have acquaintances and get a word and often a bouquet from the florists at the entrance of the passage out of the aspirants to fashion whilst the d'orsays of the chaussee d'antin merely call them by their names with a careless bonjour while some the novices remain entranced hat in hand gazing at the mademoiselle florine aspasie or euphrosine as the case may be of their nightly visions the money-making population those wonderful magicians evoking millions from small papers and political telegraphs is very different in paris to that of any other great commercial cities la finance the object of sarcasm of the last century the butt of the nobility paying thousands and tens of thousands for admissions to the supercilious reunions of the great has in the present day thrown off the yoke and formed a nobility of its own it has erected a new quartier in paris composed of streets of palaces and if not ancestral the residences of the chaussee d'antin are far more elegant and luxurious than those of the faubourg st germain nor is this society still laughed at by the few any less refined than that of the noblesse for including in its ranks all the wit and talent of the literature of the day and all the celebrities of the artistic world it has achieved a character of its own the stockbroker in paris is an elegant man of fashion the banker and the merchant are men of intelligence and courtly manners at three o'clock the most elegant equipages the finest saddle horses wait around the classic colonnade of the bourse money is made as easily in a well-fitting coat varnished boots and yellow gloves as in sordid apparel and uncleansed shoes nor do the operations of the barber and the coiffeur on the outside of the head take from the powers of conception or financial combination of the inside the boulevard still continues to fill the chairs on the sidewalk are occupied not by fashionable but by thoroughly respectable people the middle class living on small revenues in the adjacent streets who only see the outside movement of the world 
that world which they read of in modern novels and in the newspapers here on the boulevards except twice a year when they go to the grand opera do not pause yet it is difficult to go on all around you seems in such harmony of pleasure no vestige of poverty is to be seen nothing to recall any of the miseries of life ladies in such costumes you never thought could be invented to look so elegant yet seem so simple gliding along with a gentle rustling of silk that sends a thrill through you a lovely face just glancing from the window of a carriage borne onwards by swift steeds the most bewildering foot and ankle just stepping from a brilliant equipage lost to the gaze through a gilded glass door revealing the velvet and bemirrored boudoir which condescends to belong to a milliner or a marchand de nouveauté then the merry and dashing young men eight or ten in a row cigar in mouth denoting foreigners or provincials the thoroughbred parisian is chewing the cigar at this hour in a public promenade the passage des panorama is however an exception to this rule it is the very temple of smoke it is besides a crystal gallery as full of pretty things as a veritable crystal palace from all its various ramifications men and smoke pour in from the bourse from the rue vivienne from the rue montmartre the delicious pastry of the far-famed felix is towards evening so entirely impregnated with smoke as to entirely lose all individuality of a la anything but a la cigare de la havane however if you come early enough you will like the cakes and admire the chance meetings which take place on this side the boulevards at felix's as they do on the other at the passage de l'opera felix having an entrance from the place de la bourse only the ladies are those who occupy the boxes at the opera and look through their opera glasses at the others dancing on the stage now for the boulevard montmartre here the bustle of life begins to mingle with its elegancies fiacres hackney coaches old-fashioned diligences join in the throng the crowd of carriages standing round the ville de paris the greatest emporium of linen drapery in the world considerably increases the confusion behold you are jostled and pushed the lounging young men have disappeared and the last of your elegant ladies have vanished into this town of shops with its twenty-five departments of from pocket-handkerchiefs at six sous to cashmeres at six thousand francs still though the cream of the crowd no longer rises to the surface there is a fair sprinkling of the comme il faut the men however in black from head to foot with papers in their hands greatly predominate the boulevard poissonniere is a favourite domicile for attorneys barristers and notaries whose office and dwelling-house are under the same roof the shops are beginning to be less luxurious have more in store and less in the shop window than those you have just left life begins to acquire reality here the merry gamin begins to be heard and to venture his tricks and witticisms upon the pavé you are getting into his domain for there is the porte saint martin with its temporary theatre built in six weeks to receive the opera when the duc de berry's assassination desecrated the other and which slightly as it must have been put up has now lasted nearly thirty-five years here the grand atrocities of melodrama have been perpetrated ever since raised sometimes into fashion and fortune by a marie d'orval or a frederic lemaitre though its neighbour the ambigu misnamed comique has more universal success from representing deeper grades of crime proclaimed in far louder voices and with considerably more rolling of eyes and beating of drums come though we are not out sightseeing and look at the flowing mass of water at the chateau d'eau see how beautiful are those combinations of stone and water the water completing the form and carrying out the idea originated by the sculptor it is a pity that this beautiful fountain is buried in the dirty by-streets of the populous boulevard st martin surrounded by ignoble water-carts wooden pails and wooden shoed auvergnat now we are in the domain of the people the true parisian hard-working barricade-making people the blouse prevails the women though neatly are coarsely clad and their features bear marks of toil yet they it is who nightly fill all these little theatres the ambigu comique 
the gaiety and even the gymnase the theatre which first produced scribes pieces before the duchess de berry and such an audience as royalty is sure to draw now this theatre belongs to the people though not exclusively like the gaiete and the ambigu the théâtre du boulevard is a term of reproach amongst the theatrical hierarchy so much so as to make the opera comique disdain to have its façade even on the boulevard des italiens and actually to make its entrances on a side street in order to avoid the stigma the variété is a théâtre du boulevard but the aristocracy of the lorette monopolize its boxes making it quite as curious and amusing with one's back to the stage as when looking at the actors all capital and laughter moving in their way and now our boulevard grows thinner of passengers impromptu shops are all around you selling most unimaginable things at fabulously low prices marionettes dance away on their wooden planks to pandean orchestras monkeys leap and chatter on the sidewalk real live murillo boys with white teeth and laughing eyes solicit your charity squirrel in hand wax figures grouped under canvas booths are to be seen for two sous punchinello and an unhappy-looking girl in spangles squeak and beat the tambourine with convulsive fury hot coffee limonade glacée roasted potatoes fragrantly bursting lion's chestnuts hot galette anglice pie crust baked apples in turn salute your olfactory nerves and solicit your sous the gamin here reigns supreme spinning his top audaciously under your feet glorying if you stumble enchanted if you get into a passion overpowering you with squibs and imitations if your indignation has an english accent and shouting milor in all the various tones which he supposes can possibly belong to the inhabitants of la perfide d'albion for the gamay has not heard of the alliance of france and england nor of the taking of sebastopol and holds fast to his old traditions and animosities we are now within hail of the precincts of the street and faubourg of st antoine where first arose the insurgents of the great revolution and whence in later years the stream of revolt has often poured into the capital the men around you in their toil-stained blouses their unshaven beards their fur or sealskin caps look as if they might have pistols in their belts the women have a sinister defiant look and even the young girls make none of the usual coquettish attempts to attract admiration instead of the gay jeunesse linked arm in arm you see men pipe in mouth whose very accent reveals discontent and defiance a single look which might seem to them supercilious would provoke an insolent speech and any reply a blow it is amongst these people that the chef de parti with a little money and much eloquence speedily recruits an army rude undisciplined but brave dogged determined and inexorable now and then a passenger like those you have left at the other extremity of the boulevards goes by creating a marked sensation of surprise from his entire difference from all around the numerous curiosity shops situated here have brought these pilgrims of the antique into these unknown regions some years since paris went mad on the subject of old louis the thirteenth furniture and these curiosity merchants ransacked brittany and belgium for all the old and uncomfortable vestiges of this oak mania then without quite abandoning the sombre sculptured wood fashion decided to have everything gilded à la pompadour and again our indefatigable merchants set off in search of cupids and carvings in white azure and gold brocatelle velvets fans point lace the standing passion of frenchwomen who know how well the heavy guipure shows off both the form and the dress antique clocks chatelaine china and missiles are all to be found on the boulevard beaumarchais a hundred per cent cheaper than at the elegant repositories of these indispensable luxuries in the rue du choiseul or the rue de la paix women of fashion do not disdain a little economy or the fun of the excursion or of relating it afterwards and here at length is the place de la bastille that terrible prison fortress of which now nothing but the name remains beneath these stones how many thousands victims of political opinions fighting for real or for imaginary rights lie forever forgotten trodden into the dust by succeeding generations each as discontented as the last 
here perhaps will the cannon again be brought and the yelling multitude thirst for freedom and blood ay and have it too spite of that column with its golden mercury on which louis philippe declared that he had restored the liberties of the people and tried to immortalize names so ignoble that their very descendants blush to see them carved in stone beyond is still a boulevard and then vincennes but our pilgrimage is over the groups of workmen are forming around the soldiers are sitting outside the corps de garde the omnibuses are lighting their blue and yellow lamps we have loitered strangely oh for a citadine the cadran bleu asterisk a bottle of burgundy and a filet sauté au champagne asterisk a celebrated restaurateur in this quarter of paris end of chapter two chapter three of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the tuileries the tuileries how much of parisian life or the drama of parisian life as it is the fashion of french authors to style the events of our sublunary existence goes on here not in that hard-looking many-windowed palace extending from one gate to another which has witnessed so many dissolving views of various royal dynasties but the tuileries garden with its soft green turf its gay parterre studded with flowers rare and brilliant its sparkling fountains its deep tufted woods its marble statues and its atmosphere redolent with the perfume of the orange trees flourishing under the shadow of the thick foliage of the flowering chestnuts how still save for the incessant music of those nameless songsters who fill the thick trees is this garden when at six o'clock the patrol relieving guard at each entrance throws open the iron gates very soon passengers begin to enter from the rue de rivoli they are men in humble life they pass unheeding on and merely see in this garden a shorter cut to the other side enabling them to cross the pont royal and get to the other side of the seine a few minutes sooner than by the more circuitous streets this road so smoothly gravelled passes just before the palace windows beneath that stone balcony where so many kings and conquerors have bowed triumphantly to the people since the days of catherine de medici who built the palace here marie antoinette lovely and popular bent a young bride to the homage of a whole people here lately as young and fair an empress attired in bridal robes bowed before the same people the shouts that greeted the queen were louder and more enthusiastic than those which saluted the empress yet perhaps this may predict a better fate than that of a queen whose race nearly extinct seems now forever banished from the hearts and palaces of france but it grows late the terrace that borders the rue de rivoli is getting quite full at the three gates from the rue castiglione the rue des pyramides and the rue neuve de luxembourg passengers flock from all sides going to the various ministères you may almost guess the destination of these government clerks by their characteristic gait and costume this trim dapper gentleman with the well-brushed coat the stiff white shirt collar and immaculate wristbands coming over the economical but strictly clean and whole beaver gloves indicates the employé of the intérieur or home affairs he enters from the rue st honoré a street not far from the office of that department and where he has since his marriage resided there every day for the last twenty years as the clock struck nine his wife has summoned him to the same immutable breakfast of over-fried sausages a pat of the freshest butter two pounds of bread or rather two yards for he cuts off of one end whilst the other remains on the floor and the tasse de café à la crème drank out of a white bowl with a gilt edge having also in gilt letters the initials of his name he in dressing-gown and slippers and his wife in curl-papers which the tidiest of morning-caps strives in vain to hide a faded morning-gown and an old drab coloured shawl are not all shawls drab when they get old here for twenty years had this couple sat in their tiled floored dining-room with its one window looking on to a dead wall its twelve cane-seated chairs and its large mahogany table 
here have they sat contentedly for twenty years their breakfast not varying and their conversation not changing one day from another madame the well-brought-up daughter of some retired tradesman has from the hour of her marriage perfectly understood the duties of her position she has known how far four thousand francs a year would allow them to go and has gone no further their four rooms with une cuisine so small that when the frying-pan is on the fire the handle touches the opposite wall but once every day issues nevertheless though only once per diem petits plats that would make an english or an american cook's fortune but which would have required almost an expansion of the walls to contain an english christmas joint nor must we forget the little antechamber into which when the three doors and windows were all open and crossed hands in the middle it was impossible to gain admittance these had been her habitation and for the rent of these she paid seven hundred francs a year here she had brought up her two children a girl and a boy and now they being married and disposed of she continued her daily avocations she found some spare time and not being rich enough to indulge in social or artistic amusements she took to a strict practice of the catholic solemnities hearing her opera at the church of st roch working footstools and armchairs for insidious cures and enjoying those pageants of tapers incense and gorgeous dresses which the wily priests get up to appease those imaginations which monotony might lead astray this is her round of amusements but the great events of her life are the reception every sunday of her children and their families the advent of these young people is the text which feeds the conversation of the old couple for the whole week but we have kept the exemplary clerk of the home department lingering at the gate of the tuileries and he will be too late an event which has not happened once in the whole twenty years he wears the ribbon of the legion of honour and the sentinels salute him as he passes the legion of honour is given as a reward for industry and perseverance as well as for actions of daring and bravery the former virtues by the way being by far the most difficult to practise another clerk has now made his appearance at the gate having come from the other side of the seine he is tall and gaunt and his trousers are most strenuously strapped under his high-heeled boots a grey moustache quite conceals his mouth his stiff black stock disdains all linen and on his tightly buttoned coat are several crosses the sentinels present arms and add bonjour mon officier to their salutation upon which mon officier remembers old times disdains the present thinks himself the most ill-treated of men and sulkily wends his way to the ministere de la guerre the war office where a clerkship has rewarded his heroic achievements whilst these clerks are crossing the tuileries fair young girls with music books under their arms and white aproned bun nurses by their side for no young girl in paris goes out alone are tripping along in every direction the bun with hands in her pockets chatters loudly and looks you boldly in the face the young girl minces along and looks at you askance through her long eyelashes there is so much modesty and grace in this look that you think her beautiful yet she has but the universal beauty of a frenchwoman incomparable eyes is it because frenchwomen know so well the art of managing their eyes and glances that dazzled by them we take all other beauties on trust or is it that really endowed with beautiful eyes only they have made the use of them their study je ne sais but the fact is there is a fascination in a frenchwoman's face which the women of no other nation however beautiful possess at the end of the terrasse des feuillants which is separated by an iron and gilt railing from the rue de rivoli there is another terrace to which you ascend by many steps it is almost a thick wood being planted with flowering chestnuts and laburnums here too are comfortable benches ensconced in shady bowers and then here all is quiet cool fresh for the terrace leads nowhere here since nine o'clock struck from the chateau the garde meuble and the invalide has a young man in elegant morning costume been walking at every pace of which walking is susceptible and sitting in every attitude into which that commonplace habit can be perverted by his watch it is evidently nine o'clock though he had doubted the deep-toned clocks that had announced it and had appealed with a look of disdain from their decision to that of the little breguet in his waistcoat pocket 
now he seems quite angry too with this straightforward friend for after a violent rush round the terrace he looks at it puts it to his ear as if he thought it had been slumbering at its post and thrusting it away takes to gnawing the exquisitely carved head of his cane now now look at him he has darted off follow with your eyes the direction of his hasty steps there as far as he can see almost further than you can is a form advancing with a step almost as hasty as his own you admire as the figure advances the exquisite ankle and instep enclosed in that brown boot which the agitation of the walk and the flutter of the petticoats for of course it is a woman what man ever waited for or ran after anybody but a woman have revealed a simple gingham dress but oh how exquisitely made a plain plaited cambric collar a black scarf a straw bonnet with a white ribbon and the most immaculate of gloves such is the toilette of this long expected lady but this is all worn with such an air and such a grace that people turn to look at her as though she were clad in feathers and brocade when they come within a few yards of each other they slacken their pace they look away from each other then as if by chance and quite as if he had been thinking of the rise in the three per cents and she of the last discourse of the abbe ravignan with some apparent surprise and great apparent coldness they salute each other bonjour madame bonjour monsieur but then the gentleman turns round and they walk on side by side the young man's heart is beating faster than a watch which rests upon it and the tell-tale blush mantles the cheek of the lady Hermance, alfred springs spontaneously to their lips and then but then we leave them we are not going to tell all that is said between the hours of seven and twelve on the terrace des feuillants because we are not writing a love story as for the lady if you look well in the grande allee some hours later you will find her in a very different dress in very different company and looking very grand and very prudish but not half so pretty at this moment she is supposed to be aubin private houses in paris not affording this luxury french women are in the habit of going to the public baths three or four times a week or oftener provided they are at home by twelve to breakfast at la fourchette the proprieties are observed the husband satisfied and all is right balzac who applied a merry scalpel to parisian manners offered a premium to the husband in the upper and middle classes who on going to the bath his wife was supposed to frequent before breakfast should actually find her there as for m alfred he is an employé at the ministère des finances which department has a miraculous faculty of doing its own work or of getting it done by one or two whilst it pays many the clerks of this department are all young men of good family who are put there to help their own finances or to solve the problem of spending ten or fifteen thousand francs a year out of as many hundreds it is not of much consequence at what time m alfred makes his appearance at his desk but now under this terrace there arises a hubbub of voices young gay prattling voices and the monotonous murmur of the older gossip look down over the stone wall of the terrace exposed to the full blaze of the noonday sun are a row of benches a smooth wide alley surrounded by a parterre of fragrant roses and flowering shrubs is in front whilst a thick plantation of old trees shields and hides this spot from all the rest of the garden the temperature of this place sheltered from the wind and exposed to the sun is even and much warmer than that of the prevailing season and from this circumstance it is called la petite provence here delicate children are brought by their tender mothers the bright-eyed and hollow-cheeked victim of consumption whose heart yearns for italy but to whom fortune has forbidden health on this condition comes here to inhale a few balmy breezes and above all la petite provence is the resort of the shattered old soldiers from louis the fourteenth's great invalide there they come old and tottering minus legs and arms to bask in the sun to fight their battles o'er again or relate them to wondering nurses curious little girls or aspiring little boys here these aged children come to watch the gambols of the young ones the world has no longer for them hopes or ambitions henceforth it has no event that can alter their fate 
they are certain to eat drink and sleep under the same roof until they rest in the grave thus the minds of the aged detached from all passing events return to the happy remembrance of their childhood when all was true when all was joy when suffering was unknown and disappointment unforeseen many an invalid has for hours held a sickly child on his knee and soothed it into listening to his wondrous stories until its large blue eyes would seem to hang upon its very words and often has the old narrator all maimed and grey-headed hobbled to the accustomed spot long after the flowers were blooming on the grave of his young listener the day wears on under the galleries of the rue rivoli groups of lounging dandies may be seen crowding the various gateways of the hotels carriages are standing too along the chaussee at one point particularly where au premier lives a lady whose ample fortune has been made entirely out of the english visitors of whom there are on an average from twenty five thousand to thirty thousand always in paris she is one of the priestesses of the temple of fashion and employs a trade which has no name save in the french language she is called a lingère she ministers to a species of elegance which english and american women at home and in fact every other but the parisian are but just acquiring madame minette is a naval counsellor and professor but her lessons are rather dear she lives on the first floor paying a rent of about six thousand francs and in this atelier she manufactures those charming garments which conventional prudery has rendered it indecent to name in the feminine gender but which are much talked of and how much complained of when assuming collars and wristbands they belong to the masculine gender unmistakably the opposite sex are not supposed in polite language to have an existing counterpart an american lady not well versed in french and having always applied a garbled version of the french word to her own garment was quite shocked and set the parisians down as an indecent nation when informed that the same word served for the same garment both for men and women and that when she decently spoke of her own she must designate her husband's as a chemise also well madame minette only makes feminine underclothes but all the wonders of satins brocades and velvets must yield to these fairy woven mazes of cambric valenciennes muslins and lace such graceful forms such stitching such cascades of lace from the flowing night-dress such bewitching nightcaps such fabulous morning gowns lined with soft silk covered with embroidery lace and ribbons and these airy fabrics looking like a realized cobweb must they be called by the vulgar name of pocket handkerchiefs the price of one of them would have sufficed to furnish the grandmothers of the present generation with handkerchiefs for the whole of their lives the queen of the belgians is said to have presented one to her sister-in-law the duchess of orleans worth five thousand francs of course it was a specimen from the looms of brussels and the empress eugenie has ordered for herself one which is to cost ten thousand francs but we are lingering with the fair spendthrifts over the wonders of madame minette and the tuileries has been gradually fulling with its motley population the space between the terrasse des feuillants and the allée des orangers is perilous ground it is like going about amongst a community of ants nests it is literally swarmed with children not the delicate sickly children of la petite provence but your good sound rollicking noisy riotous despotic boys and girls bent on having their own way and who have passed their whole lives in getting it take care don't dream of madame say's eyes and compare them to the heavens on which you are gazing look at your feet you are positively running over two very young mamas intent upon the first promenade of mademoiselle la poupée these indignant flashes of their baby eyes speak well for their future power now see you have unwittingly executed a feat of gymnastics you have gone clean through a hoop and now you have floundered into a miniature cart filled with sand destined for the lap of some white aproned bun who is patiently sitting there knitting her stocking as she watches her young charges a little further on is a group of nurses with very young infants varying from one month old to twelve the french ordonnance for the health of young children pronounces it necessary that these young specimens of the human race should be constantly in the air sun and air contributing to their growth 
as they do to the sprouting of young vegetables the whole paraphernalia of the nursery is therefore transported to the tuileries and the mysteries of that usually impenetrable region revealed for the benefit of innocent bachelors there is another circumstance in these little al fresco establishments which probably the last mentioned observers do not fail to remark the very magnificent specimens of womankind amongst the wet nurses the appendage of every baby born in france they are generally from normandy having all the beauty which is called english which would tend to show that english beauty like english nobility is of norman origin plump fair with bright eyes fresh colour and white teeth wearing the picturesque and singular costume of their province these purveyors of food for the rising generation are by no means particular as to drapery and a painter who might desire to take them as models would have a capital opportunity of studying nature from nature's font well once free from your aunts in pink capotes and velvet blouses you dive into the allee des orangers perhaps take it all in all the most delicious promenade in all europe for even the lawns and groves of kensington in london must yield the palm to the laissez aller of the frequenters of this walk kensington is either a desert or a formal crowd a rout in fact without the lights and supper the orange trees which here so perfume the air are brought in large wooden tubs from the orangery of the palace and placed under the chestnut trees then in bloom under these are arranged hundreds of clean and comfortable straw-bottomed chairs leaving in the centre a wide space for pedestrians the left side of this alley is sheltered by a thick grove of shady trees extending with one intervening road across the garden in paris fortune from being equally distributed in families whenever the father dies is not abundant in many the french are not extravagant as a general rule they live within their income thus there are no migrations to watering-places no flights to the country whether for sea-bathing or inland airings in most of the families belonging to that largest portion of all populations the middle class now the country seat of the whole of this population is the tuileries here as we have seen the infant inhales its breath and basks a few years later in the sun here in maturer years does the respectable class of society seek amusement whilst the higher and more favoured here also pass before them in the allee des orangers stepping from their carriages at the various gates and promenading before them in all the pomp of luxury and fashion half-pay officers retired tradesmen pensioned government clerks every civil employé of the french government has a pension reversible to his widow old bachelors who have no home all take their station towards the middle of the day on chairs a little apart though within view of the crowd for two sous at a small summer-house looking building each visitor gets a newspaper or a review paying to the courteous lady who carries on this speculation another two sous and there he sits till the palace clock strikes his dinner hour here the wife of the man of moderate means having seen her house in order sent her only servant who by the by does more than three english or six irish servants work and with a civility and cheerfulness which forbids all scolding to market bin herself to mass mended her household linen and dusted her petit salon with its many knick-knacks comes in a simple and neat dress to her garden the tuileries she cannot afford to sit idle she does not care for newspapers and her confessor forbids all novel reading so placing her feet on the spars and her work-basket on the seat of the chair before her she diligently applies herself to some embroidery by which she may be able to wear some of those elegancies which she cannot afford to buy of madame minette often her children are with her perhaps old enough to sit by her side watching the arrival of le cher papa who has here a perpetual daily rendezvous with his wife in returning home from his office then after enjoying the sight of the thronged alley these peaceful citizens happy and unenvious retire to their very comfortable and tidy home their frugal dinner and occasionally as a treat a visit to one of the minor theatres meantime the allee is thronged every chair is occupied and the pedestrians by far the most ultra fashionables move but at the pace of a procession here only some very elegant toilettes may be seen 
for in the streets it is bad taste to dress showily the leaders of fashion in every rank the duchess from the faubourg st germain accompanied by her husband takes a sober walk from the entrance on the quay to the gate on the place de la concorde where their carriages will meet them and take them to the bois de boulogne the belle of the chaussee d'antin the wife of some rich stockbroker or banker sails down this allée surrounded by her moustached beau in immaculate kid gloves she is lovely graceful charming but you can distinguish her from the duchess by her absence of repose a quicker walk and a louder tone of conversation she too will go to the bois de boulogne but it will be later when she is quite sure that all whom she wishes to kill with envy have seen her dress and her bow here too is the literary woman but she is seated and has a circle round her of artists and poets now it is the ambition of a french literary woman to be a woman of the world also in paris the blue stocking is never the pedant but wears the mantle of poesy with the air of a coquette and cut in the newest fashion here on the left at the end of the allée lolling upon many chairs are a group of deputies just from the assembly they have taken their station just at the end of the promenade to which every one must come either to turn again or to leave this is of all others the group it would be most amusing to join amongst them they know the history of all who pass by and their witty sarcastic facetious and scandalous comments on all within eyeshot would form a far more amusing column in the papers than the reports of their dry and tedious speeches it is all very fine to talk of scandal and old maids but for a good hearty set of gossipers commend me to any body of men escaped from the day's business of which day the business occupies about two hours all the rest being talky talky foreigners of all nations from the well-shaved rotund and well-brushed englishman to the bearded bejewelled and unwashed hungarian the present popular heroes the greeks and poles having long ago become obsolete besprinkle the motley crowd in the allée des orangers many of these foreign dandies may be seen in the train of the english a portly woman fenced on each side by a tall somewhat stiff but comely daughter has usually a bodyguard of men who still believing in the traditional riches of the english lives in hopes of being admitted into the family then young diplomats with accredited positions good historical names and fine fortunes saunter disdainfully into the procession for a few minutes these very grand gentlemen dressed in the perfection of simplicity and elegance usually appear in groups of two or three the belle of the chaussee d'antin stops her witty war of words as they pass and in spite of herself tries to catch their attention sometimes they will condescend to the most orthodox and freezing of bows sometimes they will pass by without looking her way at all to the literary lady they give a faint smile and a familiar nod and even a cordial shake of the hand to the artists around her to the deputies the solemn bow of etiquette as they pass the duchess of the faubourg st germain they take off their hats put themselves in their most graceful attitudes and wait for a recognition but she is talking to the duke not caring who looks at her or what anybody thinks of her so they merely get a courteous obeisance from the duke the duchess saloon and society is the ne plus ultra of their desires but it requires other credentials than those they bring to get admitted there to a lady of the diplomatic corps they would of course condescend to speak but they never sit down the mere fact of sitting amongst unknown people of being jostled of having to pay two sous would be too much for their nerves here is a joyous group full of national character there are eight or ten persons and one or two of the younger ladies are dressed with elegance and fashion there are young men too wearing the cross of the legion of honour one with a fine intelligent brow is seated by an old woman in the striped petticoat and high cap of the french peasantry and is deferentially listening and replying to her questions he is not ashamed of his parentage for as he looks up he replies to the salutations of his many friends who address him by a name familiar in the annals of genius and literature here also are one or two other country people and two lovely children dressed in the picturesque elegance of the parisian mud are sitting on their knees here comes a new personage a woman with a large basket 
two large baskets full of what voulez-vous du plaisir mesdames voulez-vous du plaisir messieurs of course the offer is too tempting to be resisted but what pleasure can be had for two sous when you have spent so many golden coins in searching for it half over the world of course the group we have just been describing want plaisir too first the children shout for some then the old peasant woman and a pile of the precious commodity is deposited in a chair in the middle which is untenanted and upon the spars of which are resting the feet of several of the party the plaisir thus bought and sold is a very large wafer particularly crisp and nice why it is called plaisir we know not save that it crumbles into dust as you take hold of it and is blown away by the wind if you don't watch it the old peasant woman evidently enjoys it and her son smiles at her enjoyment the holy spirit of love for family ties is supreme in france and to whatever degree of refinement renown or riches they may rise none are ever ashamed of their origin such anomalous family meetings as the one we have described do not excite surprise or curiosity even the gaping multitude in the streets will respect and understand the motive which prompts this elegant and distinguished young man to give his arm and affectionate attention to the poor old peasant woman but it is five o'clock half past five is the general dinner hour and the gardens begin to clear the higher class have long since disappeared in their carriages for their drive they do not dine till an hour later children parents loungers all have gone the newspaper summer-house is closing for the day the marchande de plaisir goes home to renew her stock and the chairwoman sits down on one of her own chairs to count her sous at this hour in the alley called the terrasse du bord de l'eau because it looks on to the seine and forms at the same time the outer wall of the garden a few solitary ladies are seen to walk they have retired tastes they are alone they do not love the crowd yet they are tastefully dressed are all evidently young and all seem pretty ah one has dropped her handkerchief fortunately that young man so like one of those supercilious attaches only that he now moves with much alacrity has picked it up he overtakes her they are talking nay conversing and o oh, sin o oh, sorrow and o oh, womankind they are leaving the terrace together this lady belongs to a class to be found here always at this hour called le sou d'inrege a question which is generally answered by some gallant cavalier in a cabinet particulier at Verrie's, Vefours, or the Trois Frères. There is a peculiar melancholy about this deserted terrace. At one time a large portion of it was laid out as a garden for the King of Rome. Here he would come, with all his toys and books, his wonderful little carriage, and here he would receive the many petitions given to him for his father. Napoleon, it is said, never refused a petition coming to him through the hands of his much-beloved son. Here, too, in later years, when this fair child was being educated far away, ignorant of the love that had tended and watched his infancy, and of the blood that flowed in his veins, another royal boy, no less fair, played in this garden. People flocked to see the young Duc de Bordeaux, whose birth was almost a miracle, and on whom the hopes of a fading race all rested. He, too, has passed away, less remembered in his exile than the other in his grave and here still later the royal financier the wily toady of european sovereigns paced for healthy exercise until shot at by some of those many bullets which ever missed their aim fate scorning to give a hero's death to such a dastard and here the fair young princesses of the orleans race marie whose name engraved on an immortal statue will live as an artist when all her race is lost in the confusion of genealogy clementine the gentle and the good were wont to escape in a sweet communion from the dull monotony of their melancholy home the count de paris and the duc de chartres two brave bright boys keeping pace with the spirit of the age themselves dug and planted in this little garden they too have passed away they too are exiles the tuileries since the massacre of the swiss guards across the threshold of its outer walls has been fatal to the heirs of the crown of france 
when night at length leaves the garden to the solitary sentinels the palace itself with light streaming from every window becomes an object of interest it is so connected with the changes and revolutions of ever-changing and oft revolutionized france that the most unimaginative as they look on it must think of the many great and forgotten whose shadows have passed before the windows as those now do whilst you gaze for one instant excluding the light then vanishing themselves into shadow the bourbon kings possessors of versailles liked not this noisy palace in the heart of paris the first consul here held his first court levies and loved the tuileries louis the eighteenth whose enjoyments were entirely independent of ambition and who said après moi le déluge spent the fifteen years of his reign in the pavillon de flore the wing near the quay in the smallest apartments he could find translating latin authors writing witty notes and eating suppers worthy of the epicurean philosophers he had read in the morning charles the tenth loved st cloud but the duchess de berry and her elegant frivolous pleasure-loving court made the galerie de diane and the salle des marechaux ring with mirth and music the last fate at which the old nobility of france ever met the last vestige of the many generations of the chivalry of france louis philippe who would have liked to be in the chimney-corner of every citizen of paris and who did not disdain to interfere in the most trivial details of everybody's household crammed his whole family attendants servants children and all into the tuileries he too though his was the dullest court on record was forever giving receptions concerts balls etc and he assembled around him such a heterogeneous mass of visitors that many of the foreign ambassadors were ashamed of him and dreaded to approach him in his varied wanderings the citizen king had made some very queer friends and he received them now in his glory and would ask the ambassadors to invite them introduced by a king of course the invitations could not be withheld but english austrian and russian dignity shuddered at the plebeian contact the people too have twice sat on that throne and twice has the palace been confided to their guard the plate jewels furniture pictures all entrusted to them guarded by the honesty honour in the lower ranks assumes that name of men who had not five francs in the world excepting the personal effects of louis philippe which were burnt out of spite not one article was stolen or injured perhaps these rough guardians were the first who ever left power a palace and a throne without any increase of wealth prosperity or importance End of chapter three chapter four of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the place de la concorde etc the most beautiful place in the world ever made beautiful by the handiwork and the genius of man refining the builder's craft into the sublime art science of architecture and we have seen all that is renowned in europe whether called platz piazza place or square is without a doubt the place de la concorde let us take our stand here in the centre at the foot of the obelisk de luxor vestige of one of the most civilized and refined cities of bygone ages thebes now covered by the sands of the desert this relic came down the rugged nile up the busy waters of the seine to the most refined and civilized of modern cities here it stands perpetuating as it were to the parisians the sublime address of napoleon to his army in egypt from yonder pyramids forty centuries look down on you old egypt where greater deeds done ages ago in that mysterious country unveiled to us in part by gigantic ruins and holy traditions than those which have swept over the wide circle on which this monument from thy shores now stands look to the right down the rue royale so regular in its style and proportions to the white colonnade and facade of the chamber of deputies behind you the madeleine on the left is the pont de la concorde and beyond stretches the tuileries with its leafy bowers its broad iron and gilt railing with the palace in the distance and before you the wide extent of the champs elysees stretching to the arc de l'etoile which rises magnificent in the distance against a clear blue sky near you two fountains pour their sparkling freshness 
whilst colossal statues representing the principal towns of france rear their marble forms aloft in all directions carriages of every description from the liveried equipage of the foreign ambassador to the modest fiacre cross and recross in one corner near the quay those most primitive of all conveyances known as cuckoos wait their vociferous drivers soliciting you to go with them to passy auteuil st cloud or versailles the little tinkling bell of the vendor of lemonade with his barrel covered with red velvet and ornamented with silver bells attracts your wondering eye whilst clean picturesque peasant women offer their baskets with gâteaux de nanterre to show here too little children for a sou will give bunches of early violets or later in the season a whole armful of moss roses for double that sum to louis philippe it must be owned are the improvements of the place de la concorde attributable they were planned by napoleon to whom was left no time to develop his great schemes for the embellishment of his capital louis philippe fond of appropriating all he could took unto himself these plans found in the archives of the state and having no wars to wage he kept an army of bricklayers at work here on this bright spot where the gay sunbeams are dancing and all seems luxury and joy tread lightly the soil beneath your feet is saturated with the blood of a whole generation here on this place where the glad waters are dancing in the sunshine stood the scaffold of the revolution here fell the head of the bourbon who had he been born in some country village lord of a few acres would have gone down honoured to the grave here his sister pure in the midst of a tainted court generous ever mindful of the poor tender devoted noble bent her head humbly and unmurmuringly to the stroke of death here too charlotte corday the enthusiast met the heroic termination of life unfit for the common duties of her sex and here o oh, ponder as you gaze on that palace and those lofty royal edifices which stood then as they now stand but sheltered not those who had reared them here fell that being whose noble birth descended from the caesars no prince excelled whose brother filled even then one of the despotic thrones of europe a woman whom a whole populace had worshipped and poets sung for whom many would have laid down their lives for a glance from that clear blue eye or a smile from that haughty lip here on these very stones perchance rolled the head of marie antoinette when france wild with joy and enthusiasm welcomed the loveliest and most accomplished of princesses by public fête and manifestations of all kinds a crowd assembled here to see the fireworks the place was then unfinished and crowding on the scaffolding the reckless multitude bore it down and it fell into the crowd beneath where women children carriages all mingled in confusion a panic followed and thousands who came on this errand of pleasure were carried home bruised and mangled corpses did this sad remembrance and the fatal omen it had been recur to the daughter of maria theresa as for an instant on the scaffold clad in poor garments borrowed from the jailer's wife gazing on what we now gaze she thought her last thought on earth did she dream of that palace stretched before her the very windows of the room where her children had been born there before her eyes its splendours its endeared home was not that pang of memory greater than that which severed the head from the body alas that heart could bear no more grief had passed away with strength and feeling weariness a hopeless tearless weariness had taken possession of her soul poor queen to minister to whose fanciful taste an artificial village had been built in her prison awaiting her doom she took shred by shred the miserable carpet at her feet and with two pieces of wood from her scanty fire began to knit that the mechanical occupation might numb the agony of memory and thought never on this spot did any carriage with the royal arms of france pass during the restoration her daughter whose life of seventy years was spent with the brief exception of fifteen years in exile or in prison is said to have closed her eyes even when passing on the quay that she might not behold the spot where all she loved was slaughtered but now the place de la revolution the name it took after that of place louis quinze seems definitely to have become the place de la concorde to the present dynasty it can recall nothing but glory and triumph 
napoleon the present can here review his troops without the pang of the past appealing to him for napoleon the past has often ridden in glory and splendour across this square on his way to the champs elysees and st cloud let us too take the champs elysees first the grande allee then we will diverge to the right and before coming to the busiest gayest scenes of popular life we will look back for an instant on the past here is the elysee the gate before which yon stand is the one by which napoleon issued when like coriolanus he went to claim the hospitality of his enemies here stood the carriage with its four post horses slowly he came through that long french window from a small coquettish boudoir of pink and silver strange mockery of the struggle going on within its walls down this very path he came he passed the gate his foot is on the steps of the carriage he pauses hesitates england or america in which to trust england england and the die is cast the rock of st helena ocean bound rises into immortality along this portion of the champs elysees it is sweet to saunter in the full noonday sun the road so carefully watered frequented by few at this hour is shaded by thick trees their monotony broken by gardens stretching from the princely habitations of the faubourg st honore down to this spot gardens all smooth lawns hothouses vines and flowers the loveliest and most extensive being that of the english embassy sometimes a strain of music will issue from the open windows along with the singing of the birds breaking the stillness of the air or some gay children's laugh sporting in their white garments like fairies on the green sward will salute your ear but as you wend your way the path ceases in the rond-point where two delicious fountains mark the centre of the distance between the tuileries and the champs elysees and you are back to busy life again and how busy come here the busiest of days sunday or a fete day when the champs elysees are for pleasure only and pleasure and relaxation are the only objects of all you see around you every day of the week you will indeed find their gay and brilliant carriages with the fair ladies two in each open caleche their feet reclining on the opposite seat having on each side a cavalier on a prancing horse reined in to the pace of the carriage every day you may see pretty ladies on ambling steeds with fancy amazons and flying plumes thought very tasteful here but voted shockingly vulgar in hyde park english women by the by the very slaves of parisian fashion in all their toilettes have obstinately refused all foreign innovations in their riding dress the plain cloth habit and a masculine round hat as if they thought all pertaining to horsemanship essentially english each day too the same number of elegantly dressed men and women may be seen seated between the hours of five and eight while on the broad asphalt pavement as many promenaders each day walk but for the popular champs elysees take a sunday or a fete day here then is every kind of amusement and at such attainable prices talk of a fifty-cent italian opera why for fifty sous a whole day's pleasure an opera a vaudeville a ball a battle de la grande armée with refreshments and a keepsake to boot can be had first there are the merry-go-rounds in which the ladies seated in cars very like those in which theatrical deities go to theatrical paradises and the gentlemen riding fantastic pegasuses whirl round at a great pace striving as they pass to catch upon long sticks the various enormous rings suspended from poles above their heads two sous worth of this game will be enough descend the drum is beating we are in time to see in that booth all gold paper and dirty canvas the very opera they are now playing at the grand opera if you believe the gigantic affiche in front of the booth it is sung too by the very same people a great deal of the music is omitted at least by the singers but the orchestra is evidently bent on doing it all for it is playing all the time but then the dresses are splendid and the libretto is the actual libretto of the grand opera would you prefer to see the battle of austerlitz you can napoleon the first and all for two sous or arnal in some farce not the real arnal but a gentleman quite as facetious to judge by his audience for they never cease to laugh and for only two sous 
a little further on and a little later a delicious orchestra playing with taste in exquisite time the polkas waltzes and quadrilles you have heard in aristocratic ballrooms will invite you to dance this also you can do for two sous with any of those pretty modest-looking women as graceful in their tulle caps and pink ribbons their mousseline de laine dresses their smart black silk aprons the snow-white cotton stocking and neat kid shoe on an exquisite foot with the sandal crossed over an arched instep and slender ankle as was your last season's flames all diamonds lace and patchouli some of your partners though they look like the sisters of the little child they hold by the hand are the mothers and when in reply to your request one of the young-looking mothers answers with a nice courtesy and a glance at her husband vous êtes bien beau monsieur the father with his clean blouse will then take the urchin from her and stuffing him with gingerbread will sit with him proud and delighted to see mamma danser happy are the marriages in the lower classes of paris husband and wife share the same toils and the same pleasures and the influence of woman a true and unconscious one they dream not of woman's rights is to be seen in the orderly conduct of a popular crowd and the almost total absence of drunkenness in the fate of the people women in paris have many ways of gaining a livelihood and notwithstanding the outcry of the modern innovators and reformers that they do earn it is to be seen in the condition and appearance of these assemblies composed of workmen common soldiers and small tradesmen in fact of all hewers of wood and drawers of water all the women and children are neatly dressed but not above their station no prosperity in paris would induce a woman in this class to assume the silks and satins of a higher one almost all however have a watch and chain and perhaps real lace on their caps or collars instead of imitation the husband too has a huge silver watch and at home they have probably from two to half a dozen silver spoons and forks twenty-five francs will buy a couvert d'argent a silver spoon and fork is not that better than a flaring bonnet which lasts a season only in france the men do not toil to minister to their wives luxury nor the women suffer privations at home that their husbands may drink abroad but the five-franc piece saved from the mechanic's toil or the needlewoman's earnings is spent together in rational amusement the children toddling after them the baby carried alternately by father and mother then how much can an artisan enjoy for nothing the jardin des plantes botanical garden with its birds beasts and flowers a practical lecture upon natural history the galleries of the louvre forming his innate taste for the arts and teaching him the history of his country by the events they commemorate the tuileries the champs elysees st cloud versailles with its palace and its park are all his to enjoy day after day at any hour whenever he has leisure how eagerly too from the contemplation of historical pictures will the artisan seek to extend his knowledge by reading by research how may latent genius thus arise from contact with the master spirits of his own and of bygone ages come now from that al fresco ballroom with its boarded floor but with no other canopy than heaven and spreading trees see here are groups families sitting at little green tables drinking what they call beer though it is sometimes made of currants raspberries cherries or lemons near them is a furnace with a bright active cook in white jacket and orthodox white cap on his red-hot shovel for five sous he will cook you in a trice the sweetest crispest gaufre made of milk eggs and flour and powdered over with white sugar or follow that curly-headed urgent vociferous boy who is strenuously dragging his father towards that booth what rows of china of every possible denomination shape and form gilt all over looking-glasses toys work-boxes knives tumblers wine-glasses cinq sous cinq five sous is a sum in france on these expeditions what all these things five sous apiece no no this is a lottery if you are lucky you will get something if not why try again now it's full shake the lotto bag we've got the cards with the big numbers on look down the thirties yes there it is and here is your prize a sugar-basin with a gold knob 
and a white porcelain breakfast cup with in gold letters pensez à moi the moi to be thought of being ad libitum for of course it doesn't mean the dapper little weazen-faced peddler who hands you your prize with the blandest of smiles and a neat and appropriate speech of congratulations and now the stars are peeping out the moon glistens on the gilded dome of the invalides the bridges throw their bright reflections at intervals across the seine lamps twine from tree to tree at the alfresco balls lights shine through the transparent walls of the temporary theatres and stream from the windows of the cafes cafes for this night only and our little china merchant supplies all his china candlesticks with candles come to the grande allee away from this plot of ground behold from the place de la concorde to the barriere de l'étoile two miles of variegated lamps festooned from tree to tree large crystal chandeliers seeming suspended in mid-air the poles and cores being invisible from the height go all the same distance down the centre of the road illuminating the thousands of upturned faces the grave old trees the calm stars looking down the while from the clear blue heavens and now from the summit of the triumphal arch starts forth a fantastic volcano of many-coloured fire all around grows lighter than the lightest day shouts rend the air and then comes the grand bouquet its last detonation echoed and re-echoed then all dies away and gradually the living stream coming from the lurid glare into the still moonlight seek quietly homes humble and happy nerved afresh from this one day's relaxation for the toil of the morrow End of chapter four chapter five of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the faubourg saint germain cross the port neuf and enter the rue dauphine and where is the beautiful brilliant elegant paris of the tuileries and the boulevards this is paris a century ago dark narrow streets small shops with dingy windows muddy pavements and no sidewalk the faubourg st germain the home of the exclusive noblesse and of the wild reckless student is now before us with its hereditary palaces grand and gloomy and its sordid rickety houses with poverty and riotous joy on every floor there are some magnificent streets though in this last refuge of the historical names whose final illustration was an heroic death by the revolutionary guillotine the new-formed aristocracy of france the noblesse de bourse never felt inclined to attack the enemies they envy in their own camp there is something in the large iron gates the stone walls the wide and solemn courtyards which chills and which requires the traditions of rank the dignity the independence of true-born aristocracy your nouveau riche loves neat little railings with gilded spikes tiny courtyards and stuccoed walls those lofty chambers with their dark sweeping velvet curtains the furniture stately and heavy the few solemn full-length portraits the polished inlaid floor and the large hearth wide as the crater of a volcano and consuming whole forest trees chill the disciple of fashion and bring back uncomfortable feelings of insignificance whilst the d'aubusson carpets the conglomeration of lace muslin and silk excluding the glaring light nay the light altogether the elegant slim gilded and painted furniture the rosewood and satinwood tables covered with knick-knacks baptized works of art the pretty pictures with their prettier frames the soft sofas and the well-trimmed flower-stands form a fit kingdom for the wealthy whose strength and importance is their gold well may they be afraid of disappearing in toto in the midst of the noble and the elevated throughout the day no footsteps of the aristocratic population are to be traced in any of the streets of the faubourg st germain but before the other population wakes from every one of these historical hotels may be seen to issue the elegant and dignified daughters with the mother enveloped in long dark shawls the simplest of bonnets with deep black veils and followed by a servant in undressed livery carrying their prayer-books all going to early mass at the church st sulpice st thomas d'aquin 
or the small but aristocratic church of les missions étrangères the old families have preserved their outward practices of the roman catholic church as faithfully as their allegiance to their hereditary sovereign and however infidelity and new religions may have penetrated into other classes of society and been the capital of many ambitious of distinction it has never been considered necessary for the noble youth of the faubourg st germain to deny the belief of their fathers to acquire a reputation of capacity for political or intellectual affairs the unmarried women of paris see but glimpses of the world and many of these glimpses materials for day-dreams are obtained at this daily returning excursion to mass however these young girls are too well educated and too well drilled to venture anything beyond a glance at eyes that gaze on theirs and they know that the reverie ending with a deep-drawn sigh is all that will follow this first transient fancy strange destinies are these in a country where of all others hearts and imaginations are free and yet where free will is denied to woman in the only important event in life the only one for which she is made responsible in after years yet in which she follows the dictates if not the authority of those around her did you ever see a french wedding here you are on the place saint sulpice there to your right is the small windowed inquisition-looking building around which the young seminarists in their trailing dingy gowns don basilio hats and with downcast eyes are disconsolately walking houses built for the great and rich but now deteriorated degraded into sordid lodging-houses or on all the other sides but in the centre is the beautiful edifice of st sulpice with its two open towers it is gloomy enough within silent and solemn the very gilding is reflected but dimly and the saints painted in the hour of their martyrdom and not of their beatification give rise to feelings of dread rather than of consolation but now all is bright if the light of day comes but dimly through the windows hundreds of wax candles illumine the aisles on the stone floor a rich carpet has been laid rows of velvet surround the altar itself the masses of white camellias roses jessamines and white lilacs almost exclude the sight of the sacred images the aisles are all filled with new straw chairs the sacristans are in their best the beggars in their worst for that is their wedding garment all stand in waiting round the door on the steps is the swiss looking to the uninitiated uncommonly like the drum major of a regiment all gold lace with cocked hat and a sword by his side and his hand a long pole with a silver knob his legs are models and he knows it now the carriages arrive the swiss stamps his stick upon the stones and down gets the bride led by the mother fathers are rather in the background on these occasions the organs peal and the whole procession headed by the swiss marches up to the altar then the aisles fill with every sort of magnificence of dress one two three hundred or even a thousand people everybody whose name was ever known to bride or bridegroom comes of course to the wedding or at least to church when the question wilt thou take this man is addressed to the bride she takes for ever her leave of maternal control by turning with a profound courtesy to her mother to ask her permission to answer mamma responds by another inclination and then her daughter says yes which gives her freedom ever more the youngest sister of either bride or bridegroom handed by the youngest gentleman of the party and preceded by our friend with the fine legs with his sounding silver pole then goes through the crowd with downcast eyes and a velvet bag in her hand soliciting contributions pour les pauvres s'il vous plaît then they adjourn to the vestry and then for the first time the bridegroom calls his wife by her christian name though the timid bride does not drop the monsieur till some days after she has been his wife then there is feasting at home dressing dancing and a little crying and then the bride installed in her home by her mother leaves for ever the paternal roof now in all probability the principal actors in this scene have never spoken twenty sentences to each other since they were first introduced this is the way they court in france one lady says to another my daughter is eighteen she has so much every girl has a dowry if it be but five hundred francs you have known her from a child 
you see so many young men cannot you think of one to suit her of course the lady can for men are as eager in france to marry as the girls are to get husbands it is an increase of fortune and a patent of respectability in all stations in all professions the young man is spoken to and of course the young lady named to him a party is given and they meet or sometimes the girl is taken to the opera and the lover examines her through his glass if satisfied with the survey he is allowed to pay a visit then the girl supposed to be in entire ignorance up to this point is asked how she would like so and so for a husband now it is but just to say that if the girl does not approve the negotiation goes no further but as she has never spoken to this suitor and knows she will not speak to any future suitor if the man is tolerably good-looking and the tailor has done his duty why she being assured by her parents that the money is all right generally says yes then the mamma of the bridegroom comes one evening when the house has been set in order and everybody dressed in his best and after the first salutation she rises and in a solemn voice asks the hand of mademoiselle estelle blank for m achille blank then the mamma on the opposite side of the house accepts the offer mademoiselle estelle weeps and throws herself into her future mamma's arms whilst the son-in-law embraces the mother of his intended the papas shake hands the betrothed lovers released from the maternal arms mutually bow to each other and the servants bring in tea then the lawyer set to work to draw up the contract the mamma orders new dresses etc for her daughter and puts new caps and dresses on herself the bridegroom comes every evening with a grand bouquet which he offers to mademoiselle flirts an hour or two with the mother bows to the daughter and goes off the bride-elect has only to embroider quietly by her mother's side to smile to blush and simper then the negotiating lady comes in grand state preceded by an enormous trunk mamma and the bride receive her never of course heeding the trunk then the lady makes a speech opens the trunk and presents the bride with the corbeille namely the wedding dress veil and wreath two or three cashmere shawls ditto velvet dresses a set of furs a set of lace flounces a set of diamonds a watch a fan prayer-book and a purse of gold these come from the bridegroom in return the lady gets a bracelet from the bride with many thanks for the presents and the husband the mother scolds the intended for the reckless magnificence displayed when he comes at night the bride says ah monsieur blushes and throws herself into her mother's arms then the mamma gives her present to the intended six cambric shirts and six white cravats the whole trimmed with valenciennes chosen with an eye to the future pocket handkerchiefs of the bride for after the wedding day what man will be bedecked with lace at last comes the signing of the contract the bride takes one step into the world she receives her visitors and speaks nay converses with all except the intended that would be improper she gives tokens of affection to her unmarried relatives bought from the purse in the corbeille the wonders of this corbeille are displayed in one room while the trousseau of the bride given by the mother is exhibited in another embroidery linen cambric laces etc are here lavished on the personal underclothing of the bride made up in dozens and dozens of each article with piles upon piles of tablecloths sheets towels etc all marked with embroidered marks and tied with pink and blue ribbons then comes the civil ceremony and two days after the last scene of all at which we have assisted in the church of st sulpice this is the way they manage marriages in france love is out of the question but it comes after in more cases than it lasts in other countries where it is supposed to come before there is great liberty after marriage on both sides but a strict observance of outward forms women are devoted mothers and if they do not always esteem the man they invariably respect the husband the family tie is stronger in france than anywhere else if in france there are few model marriages where happiness and love are ever blooming there are certainly much fewer really unhappy ones marriage is a lottery why not let chance draw your lot rather than yourself shake the bag and bring up a blank 
do you know more of a pretty girl's temper after a month's flirtation excepting that she is susceptible of flirting than blind chance who being blind may perhaps endow you with a prize End of chapter five